And All the right. monkey flips the switch. Yeah, monkey flipped the switch. Yes, we are recording. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday. I hope everybody made it through yesterday, mostly unscathed. So let's go ahead and get it started, and we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. If you're wearing cover, remove your cover. If you're able to stand and it is physically possible for you to do so, please do so. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Before we get into this morning's agenda and announcements, we'll go and ask for any folks that are here for the first time, new members or visitors, if you'd please identify by raising your hand. And if you don't know how to do that, someone can tell you exactly how to do that. Looks like we got 31 on board so far and we've got other folks that are still coming in. And I'm not necessarily seeing anyone new for introductions, but we'll ask again, anyone that's here for the first time, brand new to Aries for San Diego, or even a visitor to the group, if you'd like to say hello, introduce yourself, this would be the right time to do it. Well, I can't find the uh, Zoom, raise your hand, but uh, this is K6KT in San Marcos. I'm a fairly new member and I'm working on all the uh, qualification items in the uh, task book, <laughs> making slow progress, but I'm going after. Very good, welcome aboard. Anyone else? All right, not seeing or hearing any additional traffic. Uh, let's go to day first section and a RRL related announcements, please. All right, Dave, what we have going on today besides the meeting is the Red Cross drill. And then on the 21st or the 23rd is the uh, um, RRL phone sweepstakes. So a uh, good weekend for that. On December 12th, we'll get an OA, uh, update date from OES. And, uh, and we have a few things coming up after that. Um, that's about it for right now. Uh, other than the lakes of both Lakeside and Yuma have been canceled for this year. So uh, we'll have to wait to uh, see what we can do. There is, should be another virtual ham fest coming up here fairly soon though. Very good, thank you, Dave. Rob. K6RJF, any training or section related announcements from the training perspective or other information for the group? I am sharing my screen. It should be coming up there uh, for you. Almost. Wait for it. Almost. There you go. There it is. It's up. Okay, up. You're good. Yeah. Happens slowly sometimes. Okay, uh, right, so in a few minutes, we're gonna be hearing the Mars presentation by Bob, AI6KU. Bob, thank you for doing that. Uh, they've got the Red Claros wind link exercise happening uh, all day today until 6 p.m. our time and instructions on that have gone out by email. We've got a uh, BioNO Power presentation by Kevin uh, from BioNO. You've maybe seen those before. We're going to be getting an update from uh, Kevin. If you're not familiar with BioNO, uh, their premier product is uh, the lithium iron phosphate batteries, which uh, some hams uh, have fallen in love with. Uh, Dave mentioned the uh, San Diego County uh, Office of Emergency Services update. Uh, we'll be at our next general meeting on December 12th. 
the November WinLink desktop software exercise is going on this morning. I resent the exercise instructions in case anybody wants to uh, take a stab at that that has not yet done so. Uh, as uh, K6KT mentioned, we've got the uh, ARIES uh, task books going on. Thank you for the ECs who are handling the uh, sign-offs. Uh, if your EC is not actively involved with doing that, any EC and ARIES uh, might be able to help you with getting sign-offs by email. Uh, we've relaxed some of the requirements for uh, activities, uh, participation, because there are no special events these days. Uh, HAMs are necessarily supporting, so we've uh, expanded that out to uh, a couple of years in order to allow people to get the sign-offs and keep moving forward with that. A reminder that uh, the Thursday evening uh, nets are canceled uh, for Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, and New Year's Eve. Uh, many thanks to the 10 net controls who are keeping our analog and DMR nets uh, moving uh, year round. If anybody ever wants to maybe substitute for the fun of it, give a stab at being a net control, uh, let me know. And I'm sure that any of the net controls uh, would be glad to uh, yield the stage for uh, one evening and, and let you uh, do be the net control. We'll provide the roster and the script. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful experience. If you've never done it before, or if you haven't done it for a few years, uh, it's good to know that you, in case of emergency, could step in and be a net control on a frequency on a repeater uh, if uh, some event goes down. Uh, Dave mentioned the, uh, the virtual ham fest uh, coming up. I think that's coming up in March. If you signed up for the last one, you probably have been receiving emails about that in the mail. Uh, also for upcoming training, a reminder that in January, uh, we're gonna have the January VHF contest. Uh, that's the national contest and that'll be happening again. And we always promote it in San Diego Aries because it's a wonderful experience for Simplex uh, VHF UHF training. So that's the uh, VHF contest in January. And also Winter Field Day is the last weekend in January. Winter Field Day, which is a time when we do side-by-side -side photos. You've probably seen on uh, ham radio social media, side-by-side -side photos of somebody in North Dakota outside doing a ham radio activity versus somebody on the beach in San Diego uh, doing ham radio activity. So it's our time to brag about the weather. Uh, and one final note here about the 60 meter net, which we started a few weeks ago. It's going well, it's Sunday mornings at 9.15. It follows the central San Diego nine o'clock uh, HF net on 75. Uh, Rob, you dropped off. Boom. I think we lost him entirely. We'll give it a second. <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful world of electronic conveyance. Yeah, did I drop out there? Yeah, you, you dropped the sink there, Rob. Yeah, you vanished. Okay. All right, so 60 meters going well. Uh, we've got uh, about 20 check-ins. Uh, regional coverage, we've had some uh, check-ins from Los Angeles and Arizona. And Y60 meters, it's a, it's a good net uh, frequency for midday stuff as 75 meters starts to fade at uh, 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, 60 meters takes over as a good uh, frequency for NVIS. And also, it's a good frequency for interoperability uh, with government uh, operations uh, on, on 60 meters, those five megahertz channels. Uh, uh, there's some overlap between government service and uh, amateur service. And that's all for me, K6RJF. Very good. Thank you, Rob. Uh, general announcements and things that uh, Dave has already touched on, Rob's already touched on at least a little bit. The, um, the January VHF contest is kind of a fun event. As Rob mentioned, a lot of it is good practice trying to go out and work folks under whatever the current conditions are locally uh, is always an interesting thing, especially in the month of January. There's also the possibility, although it hasn't happened so much in recent years, but there is actually a little window of opportunity that seems to be very seasonal for those that are on six meters. 
and uh, it affords folks sometimes the ability to go out and work some band openings, even some things out of the country, and I don't mean Canada or Mexico, I mean off of the continental U.S. and into other parts of the world. Uh, it typically falls within that window as well and doesn't last very long. It isn't quite like the spring to summertime six meter season that most folks might have been exposed to in, in days gone by. There's a uh, interesting piece of that that goes right along with it. Rob mentioned winter field day. And with that, you know, folks, you would think in Southern California would have maybe a slight advantage over folks that are on the East Coast for that, as well as the VHF contest, because typically in the month of January, when those events happen, the Eastern Seaboard and the Midwest, where a lot of those contacts are typically made during the summer months very efficiently and effectively. And a lot of the folks up and down the higher density population centers, especially along the, the New York and you know up and down the coast on the right side of the world, uh, happen to have the population. Those folks really do well in the mid-year events for field day and for field day as well as for the, um, the VHF contest. Usually for January, we have slight advantage. We don't have you know feet of snow, feet of ice, or multiples thereof, and we don't have equipment that's broken because of it. We actually didn't have that happen two or three years ago. We had a couple of years in a row where for those weekends, we actually had the stormy weather, we actually had the snow, and we actually had conditions from both an operating and weather perspective that weren't exactly uh, great for Southern California. But I would like to thank folks for the January VHF event, using that as practice for yourselves, as well as folks getting on the air and providing contacts, the, the mobilization efforts that we've done and the efforts in getting people on the air, mobile and from base uh, operations has been very significant to the fact and to the point that it's starting to spread into Orange County, it's starting to spread into LA. If you've attended any of these events over the last couple of years, you've seen the number of participants uh, build quite a bit, which is super fabulous, especially for January. I'm not sure if anybody was aware of this shy of Rob and maybe Dave, but uh, folks on the East Coast, especially in VHF events, pretty much have this stuff locked up. If you're in Vermont, Connecticut, New York, those people are literally working some of the highest density areas of ham radio operators for VHF that they can. So typically their scoring is very, very high. Um, and they usually hold all of the records for events like that uh, compared to Southern California anyway. A couple of years ago, we went out and did one of our you know annual events. We went out and made this a rally for Aries as far as getting people on the air, learning the user equipment, encouraging different operations, which was very cool. And in the process, the left coast, which is us, took away the standing VHF January FM high score from the East Coast and did it pretty effectively, about uh, 2,000, 3,000 point spread from the previous record that was set. And last year, that record was reset to a higher bar once again with very serious competition. Folks on the, uh, folks on the right side of the world got, uh, got their folks together and rallied behind an operator that was out there that's kind of a friend of mine and an acquaintance of mine through the VHF circles. And he actually did beat my score from two years ago this past year. And fortunately, we had enough participants in our event locally that we managed to go out and reset the bar. And actually we were the first ones to 10,000 points and beyond here on the left coast. So I wanna thank folks for being on the air and participating in January. It, there was a lot of things going on that weekend. We had summits on the air, we had other participants, we had Aries folks, we had folks from Santa Barbara down to you know Baja California that were running. We had folks that were still kind of going to their own version of their Quartz Fest and Ham Fest events. Uh, there was a lot of things that were going on that helped contribute to that. And that was super cool that it all happened the way it did. So let's do it again. Let's make January a big event for both Winter Field Day and for the VHF event. Let's see what we can go out and do to carry on and keep the tradition of keeping those records here on the left coast for that. Uh, as far as Field Day goes, 
Uh, it was mentioned on the Thursday meeting, and I wasn't going to bring it up until today, but someone else kind of popped the cork on the champagne bottle, so to speak. Uh, for those that participated in field day last year, obviously a very unique event because of the current conditions we're all under. And they had a special participation uh, configuration for scores to be aggregated by clubs or groups. So you could individually contribute your score from home or from wherever you're operating to a club or a group. First time they've actually done that. So we knew this was going to be a unique year from that perspective. And that would be a unique circumstance from that perspective. Uh, it looks very clearly, although the interactive score um, and logging utilities are not quite posted yet, but from the line scores that were available, it clearly looks like San Diego Aries won San Diego and probably a good chunk of the US as well. Uh, it looks like our combined scores were, if I remember correctly, uh, low to mid 12,000 point range. And that put us just shy of being in the top 10 nationally. So again, thanks for everybody that contributed to that, participated, played. Uh, candidly, I'm going to tell you that I think I would be already anticipating that we're going to be in a very similar mode of operation this coming year. And I would probably just be prepared and expecting to go out and operate under much of the same rules and guidelines and conditions that we had to uh, this past June. And maybe, again, you've got some time. We're all building stations. We're improving things. Some of us are spending a lot more time at home. And we've actually got the ability to go out and practice on the air more frequently uh, during the day. Or we might have breaks in our work schedule. And uh, we look forward to going out and getting a lot more folks on the air this year and hopefully getting people on the uh, bands that they're not normally running on HF and uh, in the modes that they hopefully will enjoy operating on with the group. Any questions? Any comments? All right. If we don't have anything else, I've been practicing this all day. Without any further ado, I give you AI6KU. Ah, this is AI6KU, this is Bob. And um, today I'm going to uh, do a short presentation and discussion after the fact, perhaps because of the difficulty with interrupting things here on uh, on Zoom. So I'll sort of maybe save your questions till the end and we'll uh, take them. But uh, I'm going to introduction to Mars. What is the military auxiliary radio system? And uh, we'll, we'll talk about sort of what, what is that and how do amateurs play in it. And so uh, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And we'll share that screen. And I will go to the uh, slideshow and we'll play from here. And so, so let, let me know, uh, can everybody see that okay? That yes, looks good, Bob. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. Um, so the only thing, other thing will be whether or not it actually changes the slides when I change them down here. But uh, so this is the military auxiliary radio system. It is a um, it supports the Global High Frequency Enterprise Network, which is a DOD, uh, Department of Defense network. Um, and the, this is its mission. This is the mission of Mars uh, on a, um, for the United States. Um, Mars is not an international uh, organization. It is, a, it, is, it is unique to the United States. And I'll get into a little bit of the history of it here in a few minutes, but, um, the idea is that we deliver unclassified, unclassified messages using HF radio. Um, those, some of those messages are delivered verbally, but primarily we deliver uh, encrypted messaging capability digitally. Um, we are, it's designed to be the backup or the auxiliary in a cyber impaired or denied environment. So when, when telephones and the internet are gone um, on that, 
on that worst day of how is it that the objectives of the United States uh, can get communicated and how come and how can uh, information about the various regions of the United States get communicated. So um, support the US military activities. Um, so in addition to sort of that uh, global high frequency enterprise network, um, a long haul text message relay, um, again, um, uh, using HF, point-to-point uh, -point teletype and voice circuits, again, over HF, as well as phone patch and radio wire integration um, using, a, uh, and again, it is all oriented towards HF. Some of the administrative nets and things like that do operate on VHF, um, but, um, but, but the, the real intent of Mars is HF and knowing how to use HF, knowing how to get messages through on HF, uh, knowing how to operate as a network of HF operators to fill in the gaps and get, thing, get the message through. And that's sort of the, the motto of Mars is message through. All right, uh, background. Um, there used to be a Army Mars, Air Force Mars, and a Navy Marine Corps Mars. Uh, Navy Marine Corps Mars was disestablished in two, 2015. It had become sort of less active even well before that. And uh, it grew from what was called an affiliate activity within, the, within DOD to become an auxiliary system, uh, much like the Coast Guard Auxiliary, K1CT is probably uh, Familiar, he's a, he's a member of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. So, um, and that, it ups its standing within the military. It gives it some money and some, uh, and some authority to be able to do some kinds of things. Um, the historical primary, what, what they used to do was Mars Grams. That was the biggest thing going back to Korea, through Vietnam and through the Middle East Wars and the various conflicts there. Uh, it was to get Marsgrams and to give HF phone nets for service people overseas and their families. The internet has largely uh, usurped that uh, requirement. Uh, most people can now, even in far off places, pick up a phone and call their wife and family and uh, certainly text message and uh, or use various messaging apps to uh, to get to get through and talk to them. So. Um, a lot of that went away. However, DOD has um, repeatedly rediscovered uh, through the years the importance of HF and, and rediscovered the importance of amateur radio operators um, to be able to know how to use HF in ways that the military probably doesn't, uh, has not had the training and the et cetera to do. So, um, so Mars steps in. And uh, let's see, I need to get rid of this. How do I get rid of that? There we go. Um, so what are the tasks? That was the mission. What are the tasks? We staff the global high frequency enterprise network. We amateur radio operators who are members of Mars, as well as uh, some official uh, GS level people and contractors uh, staff and maintain the global high frequency enterprise network. And uh, a lot of that is done and reinforced um, on a daily basis through various nets that uh, Mars operators join uh, both the voice and digital messaging capabilities. Um, on that worst day uh, or when, when a particular region has had a, a worst day, um, they provide HADR support um, through infrastructure status, uh, you know, what's happened, uh, what roads are not, what roads aren't open anymore, uh, where did, uh, how many hospitals are available, can you find out, um, what's the weather like, um, are airports open? So all of these things are relevant to the U.S. government making a response to a disaster or human um, or humanitarian assistance re event. And uh, knowing what airports are open, how can we get supplies in, and all those kind of things, this is what Mars operators do. And, and we do it, but we can't do it alone. There are actually a very small number of, uh, of Mars operators um, in the whole San Diego region. I probably can count on, on 
one or two hands all the Mars operators. So we look to a great extent to the amateur radio community, to to METs, to 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 um, agencies like Ares and the ARC and others, uh, including uh, RACES and the Sheriff's Office and others that we can communicate with in order to be able to get information back up the chain, so to speak, to state and local authorities. Um, well, to state and local authorities is necessary, but primarily to the U.S. government. And um, you know, another couple other things we do is train soldiers and National Guard in HF radio fundamentals. And um, there are uh, uh, Mars operators who go out and, and teach soldiers and National Guard operators about HF, how does it work, what are the issues that you need to know about? What do the different bands mean? And, uh, and how do you communicate on those different bands at different times of the day? What do the various uh, solar conditions mean? Um, so all of that is a part of uh, what Mars operators do. And then we still continue to process Mars grams um, worldwide as necessary. And then there's a, uh, and then the four, for amateur operators, then there's an annual X band, a cross band exercise, and where Mars operators transmit on Mars frequencies that are not authorized for amateurs, but they listen, but we, we listen on the amateur frequencies for response. And, and there's a, you get a cute um, card back from the mail uh, if you participate, and it's, a, it's kind of a fun thing to do. And I did it as a, as an amateur uh, before I was long before I was a Mars operator. And um, so hang on a second, I just lost, a, lost one of my ear, earbuds there. Um, but I used to do it um, as an amateur, it was a lot of fun. And so uh, I encourage everybody to look for the announcements coming out about that and, uh, and participate. Um, it's fun and, uh, and you get to listen on other frequencies than you normally listen on. So, Let's see. What does it take? Uh, I'm not. This is not trying. I'm not trying to recruit anybody. Um, there, it's as I've discovered. There are there are requirements and expectations that go along with being a Mars member. It's a bit of a military organization. So if you've been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been in the military, you're probably going to be in for a little bit of a surprise. It's not huge, and it's not. And if you're interested and, and want to do it, then there are ways to apply, and I'll get to that here in a few minutes. But must be 18, must be a U.S. citizen, uh, general or extra, because of the frequencies that you'll be operating on. Um, no, no felony convictions, drug convictions, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and you have to have the necessary equipment. Uh, so, and that equipment, your transceiver or transceivers will have to have the Mars mod done to them. Uh, if, and if you don't know how to do it, uh, I, I will say I paid paid forty five dollars to HRO to modify my TS five ninety, and it was well worth it since it was surface mounted equipment, surface mounted resistors and things like that that had to be changed. So, and I don't do surface mount. Um, and then uh, training, uh, you do some hands on on air training um, using your equipment. Again, this is all uh, using your own your own equipment, your own computer, your own antennas and radios and amplifiers, and uh, and you'll go through a task list uh, that starts out with needing ICS 100 and ICS 200, with I don't, which I know most all of us have already done, and uh, so you just submit your certificates for having done that. And uh, if you haven't done it, uh, neither of those are very complicated courses, and they're they're pretty easy to do. But they, but it is a it is a, a requirement, and uh, there is a, a task list, and that you'll go through, and it, and then there will be a training coordinator assigned to you, and that person will help you uh, get through that list, and that and they really are interested in you getting through that list. Your your initial authority to operate is a training it has a T in it. Uh, for training, and uh, you'll get issued that uh, so that you can get on the frequencies and author and you're authorized to get the mods mod um, if you're not doing it yourself. Uh, the equipment hasn't already been modified. You're authorized to transmit on the Mars frequencies and you're given access to 
the bands and what are the different channels because um, they're usually just referred to like mic one two three um, so you're without the list uh, the cross reference you're you don't know what what frequency mic one two three might be so um, and then you'll get an authority to operate uh, it's much like a license you're given a new call you're given a call sign it's a Mars call sign that you will use when you're only only on Mars frequencies obviously and on Mars nets so that um, that's sort of the background what it takes um, to be a member and um, so what are the responsibilities if you're a member um, monthly participation reports you'll report sort of how many hours did I spend working on Mars you'll report how many hours you were on the air with Mars and there are some minimums um, they're spread out quarterly so it's you know if you miss a month it's uh, because you were on vacation or your radio was broken or something like that it's it's not the end of the world it's easy to make up in three months um, the minimum amount but there there is an expectation and if you don't meet the expectation um, then you will uh, essentially have your authority to operate withdrawn uh, as I said it is a bit of a military like organization and it's run by the military and and in that regard then it is um, um, you're expected to sort of toe the line uh, what are the requirements for radio? Uh, you have to be able to send and receive on all the uh, fixed service bands, uh, two through 30 megahertz, uh, single sideband, um, and, and then mill standard digital. Uh, there's software that enables you to send uh, digital encrypted messages. And uh, so you're provided that software uh, free of charge. And then uh, a radio connected computer. Um, it's going to have to be Windows 10 or Linux uh, capable of running the software, um, which it, and it's not. It, you're not going to want. I mean, I've I kind of had to sneak up on it personally. I started out with this sort of old uh, laptop that I could get Windows 10 loaded on, and I could kind of make it work. But the software is pretty demanding uh, in terms of of uh, its requirements so i've eventually had to upgrade to a much more modern uh, computer you'll have to have an internet connection uh, that's primarily to load software and things like that and some of the training nets are conducted as webinars so you'll have to have that internet connection um, and it is helpful to have a linear amplifier you don't have to be you know doesn't have to be 1500 watts or legal limit um, but it is helpful, um, and the people who are on the nets who don't have amplifiers, um, they they pay a price because people can't hear them, uh, they can't get the messages through, and it's frustrating. So um, linear amplifiers help. Again, though, keep in mind that everything that you have has, including the antennas that you use and things like that, have to be able to operate often well outside of the amateur bands. So if you're, if, if everything you have is tightly tuned to particular amateur bands, you're, you're gonna wanna have a system that you can, you're gonna wanna modify all of that uh, or change it out or whatever else so that you can, uh, can utilize it on uh, outside of those bands. All right. Um, so what are the tasks that an operator has? Check in on the air uh, at least once a week. Um, there are there are two to three daily nets regionally, and for you to check in on. So it's usually not hard to get in on on one of them. There is a pretty much there is a one once a week. There's a training net, and that's pretty much a requirement that you that you be on that training net uh, regionally here in San Diego. It's on Tuesday evenings. Um, sometimes 1800 sometimes 1900 and uh, and sometimes it's on the web but often usually it is on the air and uh, we are sending and receiving messages as well as uh, doing net net activities you need to maintain a log of your mars activities a log is an important part of what an operator does and uh, and then you need to have you need to be able to send and receive messages so these are mill standard waveforms and formats and message formats and you on on any of the nets uh, there may be 
specialized messages that somebody has asked and they'll have provided a format and you'll load that format and, and load information into that message and send it. And you'll also receive messages from the other operators on the net. And you'll, uh, so you'll encode your own messages and you'll decode messages uh, from other operators. Again, um, as distinguished from amateurs, uh, radio, uh, AR, I mean, uh, SDC rules, uh, for Mars, all the message traffic is encrypted. Uh, and they are moving, uh, though this is going to be, I'm sure, three or four at least years off, they are moving to digital uh, voice, digital encrypted voice transmissions as well. Uh, part of it is that there are a number of um, people out there who, who try to disrupt Mars nets and, um, and try to intercept information from Mars nets and try to put together uh, you know what's going on and things like that. So um, there's some there's some indication that Mars will eventually move to um, uh, all digital, all encrypted voice as well as as uh, digital. Um, and then you're also required to participate in at least, and and that's the, that's the minimum expectation. At least one of the national DoD exercises. There are usually three to four annually, and they run anywhere from three to four weeks. It's not difficult and nobody expects you to be on the air for three to four weeks at a time. There are some people who are, um, and, uh, but uh, they do expect participation in that exercise. Usually the exercise has an objective for training and, um, and sometimes the objective is just to sustain network operations. So if we were in a, a um, situation where the internet and commu other communications were disrupted, uh, and HF was the only uh, show in town, then uh, it, it would be important to be able to stay up and operational as a net, uh, as regional nets, and then as a national net as well, interconnected but with the regionals. And then also you're expected to stay up to date with the software and the procedures, and that's getting better. That used to be really hard. Uh, the, the software came from eight or nine different places, and it was always changing, and you were never quite sure what the latest version was, but Mars in the last, uh, I'll say two years, but it really in the last year has really standardized that and made it, uh, um, it is, has made it something that is, is easy to do and, and created installers so that you don't have to, you know, install in this order and make sure you install this first and make sure you install that later and then don't do this first. Uh, it, it was a mess. Um, and, and even I who, made my life out of out of computer programs and programs um, in DOD was just maddened. So anyway, that's a, that's much easier to do now. So I uh, that's, don't let that stand in your way. And for more information, there you go. And there's also on that uh, page uh, or one of the subs one of the lower pages, there's an application if you're interested in applying. And uh, so let me open it up. Uh, see if there are any questions. Bob, can you say what approximate frequencies there are? Uh, all, all over the board, all the way from from down below three to um, thirty, and uh, and they're they're spread out. Uh, in between in there. So no, I, I actually I can't disclose those frequencies. Uh, um, but I can tell you that they are all over the place. And some people, uh, even though they might have a radio that can say, you know, or a linear that can say get a 1000 watts out on one frequency, you know, up say, you know, a little over four megahertz, uh, they'll turn they will go to some other frequency and they'll be lucky to get 100 watts out. So uh, some operators have struggled and there, there's some equipment that is better than others in terms of being able to tune outside of the amateur frequency bands. All right, we got a hand up with Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Mike. Okay, yeah, this is Mike N86MB. So you are um, operating outside the ham band. So I guess because you can use encryption, you're not bound by the ham rules. Uh, they're all specific Mars rules, is that correct? 
That is correct. Mars rules, Mars encryption. Um, and um, so, yes, that is, that, that's exactly right. And, and your ATO, your authority to operate with your call, with your Mars call sign is what authorizes you to be able to do that, uh, to operate uh, and send encrypted, send and receive encrypted messages um, on those other bands. So, yes. Do you send that, do you send that stuff like we would send it with a sound card uh, over digital or is there some other interface that they give you? Nope, it's a, it's over a sound card. There is special so, there is a special software program, uh, which enables you to 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 build a message and be able to transmit it uh, using encryption. But uh, no, it's regular sound card signal link. Uh, my TS five ninety has built in sound card capabilities, and it works just fine. Great, um, thanks. Any other hands? Any other? Anybody else have any other questions? Hey, Bob, what is the legal uh, power limit uh, when operating in Mars? Um, what it takes. So there's that not like a 1500 watt limit or anything like that. It's like unlimited. In certain situations, it would be unlimited. Yep, that's that is true. Uh, mostly, everybody adheres to the 1500 watts. Uh, primarily to keep from, I think, from interfering with, you know, other places because, um, and it's our, and, and I will tell you, I, I have a very, very capable linear and radio and, and uh, I, on, on a lot of the frequencies, I, even with mine, I will struggle to get eight or 900 watts out um, of the linear. It just, it, it's so far, some of the, some of the frequencies are so far out of the hand bands that uh that that even even mine which is kind of known for having some pretty wide uh, bandwidth uh, has trouble but uh but if but everybody adheres to 1500 i think uh if if the balloon went up and and all hell broke loose that we would probably get told uh, we could go ahead and go above that if we needed to all right we got another hand up with uh bill bill Got a hand up, Bill? Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. Question. Do you hear me now? Wow, well, we hear you now. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, I had uh, neglected to uh, line up my sound card correctly. I was uh, talking to my signal link instead of my computer. Um, is Mars using any uh, automatic link establishment? Yes, Mars does use ALE. We have a number of stations regionally and nationally. Um, that uh, that run and and they're 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 store and uh, and retrieve capabilities at this point in time. So uh, messages get re relayed, messages get sent to the ALE stations, and then um, other ALE stations can retrieve them. And then some of the operators then as well make those uh, available, so that I, even though I'm not running ALE, can go in and query their uh, their server and say send me tell me what you have and then i can tell you okay i want messages one and two and five and so i can retrieve those messages had i not been on the net when those messages were actually transmitted great thanks i do have a follow-up question or two Go um, for it. Uh, does is mars uh, also using winlink and if so uh, is the encrypted uh, message requirement extend to the winlink mars does not use winlink um, the, the messaging software we use, besides all the message creating and things like that, uh, the messaging software we use is MSDMT, which okay. is not Mars unique. It is uh, other, other places around the world use MSDMT. Uh, so, but it is the, it is the software that uh, Mars uh, uses to uh, send and receive encrypted messages. Roger, thanks. Um, you know, in Coast Guard Auxiliary, we tried to use that as well, but uh, uh, since uh, many of our operators are not amateurs, uh, it became a little technical challenging. So uh, we're primarily using FL Digi and, and those modes. Is, uh, 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 so all of yours is uh, with MIL standard waveforms. There's uh, no uh, FL Digi uh, waveforms being used? That's true. Yeah, we do. So, so sometimes uh, if, uh, 
if a 213 comes to me, um, say from somebody in Mars, um, and they say, well, send this, we need to get this to uh, Dave, and that's happened. Um, and, uh, and so then I will turn around and I will take that, the unencrypted version of that message now, and I'll put it onto uh, Winlink um, and send it to Dave. So right. that that interface does exist, and and it's expected, and that's part of that's that is often part of the one of the exercises is here are all these Winlink messages, here are all these two thirteens that are being sent out by Mars headquarters or regional headquarters or something else, and they want to get them to somebody within Ares or somebody within ARC, and so then uh, people at the local level. Uh, like me, well, then go ahead and send that on to to uh, to Dave or to Bob at Art Red Cross or somebody else. Great, right. thanks, Bob. That's all I have. You're, thank you. Any other hands? Anybody else have any other questions? All right, Dave, back to you. and get my microphone to unmute. Uh, Bruce, back over to you. Over to Rob. Yeah, Rob is here. Hey, quick question for Bob. Uh, how long is the training pipeline uh, for you uh, from uh, soup to nuts to get qualified as a Mars operator? And what is your Mars call sign? Yeah, I'm, I don't want to associate my Mars call sign with my amateur call sign, so I won't. I won't give you that here. Um, and um, and, it, and since I only use it on the Mars frequencies, it, um, um, if you if you are in Mars, you can look me up in the roster. But let me say, um, what was your first question? Let me back up. I'm oh, sorry. I'm How long did it take to get one. trained? Oh, um, for me, it was like two months, and I had. I had what I needed in order to go ahead and get my authority to operate without the training designation. So, um, so that wasn't, um, it wasn't too bad. There are other people who have been at it for uh, months and months. Um, and it seems that the, um, just a, as an opinion, regionally here in the Southwest region, um, which includes uh, Arizona, um, in Nevada, um, the Air Force Mars people don't provide their trainees with very much help. Uh, kind of a, you know, see to your pants, figure it out mentality. Uh, the Army Mars, if, if you, by the way, if you're, this is if you're interested in joining, but the Army Mars people have um, a much more proactive approach. Uh, the training person is incredibly helpful. Call me any time of the day or night kind of person gets on the phone with you. We'll spend hours if that's what it takes to help you get up to speed, help you get the software loaded. Um, he'll share screens with you and help you figure out everything that you're going to do. So, uh, but, um, but having, wa having watched trainees from both services and the, uh, at least regionally here within the Southwest region, the Army Mars people are far more proactive in terms of, we want to help you get rid of that T in your call sign. Bob, thank you. Question? All right, we got sure. another Heather. question. Uh, Heather, my, I question think. my question has to, it goes back to the call signs. How are they different from the amateur call signs? How would we, if we saw it on a piece of paper or someplace, how would we, no, that was like a Mars call sign. It, well, uh, the Army Mars call signs are all going to start with Alpha Alpha Romeo 9 for Region 9, uh, or Alpha Alpha Romeo 8 for Region 8. And the Air Force call signs are going to start with AFA Alpha Fox Tri Alpha 9 or another region, and then, um, and then a, usually a two or three letter designation after that. Some of the billet call signs will again start with Alpha Alpha or Alpha Fox Alpha, and and that would be the way to recognize those. 
And do their regions overlay with our regions or do they have different regions? They, they mirror the FEMA regions. All right. So if you look at a FEMA, road, FEMA regional map, um, Mars overlays that regional map. Thank you. All right, we got Jay with a hand up. Jay. Um, right. You said you mentioned there was some software, and you said the MSDN. I'm curious. I, MSDNT. I, I'm thinking that's probably not right. Could you spell it, please? Sure. Micro M MS Microsoft. <laughs> that's not really it. Mike Sierra uh, DMT Delta Mike Tango. Delta Mike Tango. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, I don't see any other hands up. All right. Uh, anybody else have any any questions at all for uh, for Bob this morning? No hands up. Uh, and Bob, if any, if, uh, yeah, just let me close out by saying if anybody has any other questions or um, that I would su suggest first go look at that call, go look at that website uh, there at the end of the. Um, the Army Mars call the Army Mars website. There's a ton of information in there. I mean, there are documents and everything else. Uh, but if you have some specific questions or something like that, um, just feel free to drop me an email, um, and uh, I'm good. in uh, QRZ. Somebody asked in the chat if I have it. If I don't have a linear, am I out of luck? No, you're not out of luck. Uh, if you have a, if you don't have a linear, you know, you can go to 100 watts, and, and um, it's probably not a QRP place to be, <laughs> or it's not a place to be QRP. But um, but I have been out on a camping trip or whatever else, and operating with well less than 100 watts, and managed to check in at least on voice um, with the with the net. So it's and that's kind of fun um, to do. Um, so, but uh, no, you're not out of luck with a linear. You're just gonna struggle uh, sometimes to get through some of the noise and and um, and get to the stations that you're trying to talk to. But we do a lot of relaying. So that's the other side of, and that's part of why Mars is, is so effective is we're very, very, very good at one station relaying on to other stations. And sometimes that's two and three times um, but um, that's that's a valuable part of um, of Mars and and this and the regional networks connected to the uh, national networks. So uh, relaying is a big part of it. So no, you're not out of luck without a uh, without a linear. Anything else? I think Bill, you went mute. And Bill unmuted there. I don't know. If he had a question. K1CT, you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to mute. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I... All right, that's all for me. All right, any other questions from, from anybody for, uh, for Bob? All right, any other questions in general? Bruce, Rob, do you have anything else this morning? I am good to close. Thank you very much, Bob, for doing the presentation today. You're welcome. One other thing I might add, somebody asked me uh, on another forum uh, about Windlink and somebody here asked about Windlink and Mars. Uh, Windlink uh, is not used in Mars, but Windlink is used in shares, which is a DHS version of Mars. So if you're interested in, in that, I am not in shares, I don't have a shares call sign or anything else, but they do use WinLink, and they are uh, uh, they. So that is a that is an option if uh, if you're interested in getting involved in something um, like Mars or something like that, but you don't want to be involved with DoD. Then shares is another way to go because that's a Department of Homeland Security, and there you're working with sheriffs departments and. Uh, off to the OES, uh, Office of Emergency Services, and um, across hey, the nation. 
Uh, Bob, this is Danny from Red Cross. Uh, we are we do have the authorization for shares now, but we're modifying one of our antennas. We got to get that up on the building, so when that occurs. So, anyways, that's all I have. All right. Yeah. So ARC here in San Diego. That's Danny um, um, and others um, do have apparently have a shares account and. Um, that also uh, operates on frequencies while outside the amateur uh, realm and with authorizations that uh, we as amateurs don't have with our amateur call sign. Uh, Dave another. will be setting up a shares uh, presentation sometime in the future. Yeah, I'm working on that, just trying to get hold of the right people and, uh, and everything. Um, we were all set to get something going and uh, uh, the guy retired, so that that put that one out of reach. So we're we're still working on a couple other things here. Uh, Bruce, you have anything else? You said you were pretty well good for the day. I think we can wrap it up if we've got questions answered. I don't have any additional traffic. All right, very good. If there are no other questions, thanks, Bob. That was a great presentation. Appreciate it. A lot of good information, and we will get the uh, recording posted uh, soon. So uh, everybody can go back and review everything. And that way, if they missed the uh, uh, URL for Army Mars, they can uh, catch it in the recording. And uh, we'll go ahead and close this thing out and say uh, 73, be safe. And uh, see everybody on the air next uh, Saturday and in between. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Bruce.